The Easter Rising, also known as the Easter Rebellion, was an armed insurrection in Ireland during Easter Wick, 1916. The Rising was mounted by Irish Republicans to end British rule in Ireland and establish an independent Irish Republic while the United Kingdom was heavily engaged in World War I. It was the most significant uprising in Ireland since the Rebellion of 1798. Organized by seven members of the Military Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the Rising began on Easter Monday, 24 April 1916, and lasted for six days. Members of the Irish Volunteers, led by schoolmaster and Irish language activist Patrick Pearce, joined by the smaller Irish citizen army of James Connolly, along with 200 members of Cuman RMBAN, seized key locations in Dublin and proclaimed an Irish Republic. There were isolated actions in other parts of Ireland, with an attack on the Royal Irish Constabulary Barracks at Ashbourne, County Meath and abortive attacks on other barracks in County Galway and at Enniscorthy, County Wexford. With vastly superior numbers and artillery, the British Army quickly suppressed the rising, and Pierce agreed to an unconditional surrender on Saturday 29 April. Most of the leaders were executed following courts martial, but the rising succeeded in bringing physical force republicanism back to the forefront of Irish politics. Support for republicanism continued to rise in Ireland in the context of the ongoing world war, revolutions in other countries, the conscription crisis of 1918, and the failure of the Irish Convention. In December 1918, Republicans won 73 Irish seats out of 105 in the 1918 general election to the British Parliament, on a policy of abstentionism and Irish independence. On 21 January 1919 they convened the first day and declared the independence of the Irish Republic, and later that same day the Irish War of Independence began with the solo headbag ambush. Background. The Act of Union 1800 united the Kingdom of Great Britain and the Kingdom of Ireland as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, abolishing the Irish Parliament and giving Ireland representation at Westminster. From early on, many Irish nationalists opposed the Union as they saw it as an exploitation and impoverishment of their country. Opposition took various forms, constitutional, social and revolutionary. Constitutional nationalism seemed to be about to bear fruit when the Irish Parliamentary Party under Charles Stuart Parnell succeeded in having the first Home Rule Bill of 1886 introduced by the Liberal government of William Ewart Gladstone, but it was defeated in the House of Commons. The second Home Rule Bill of 1893 was passed by the Commons but rejected by the House of Lords. After the fall of Parnell, younger and more radical nationalists became disillusioned with parliamentary politics and turned toward more extreme forms of separatism. The Gaelic Athletic Association, the Gaelic League and the Cultural Revival under W. B. Yeats and Lady Augusta Gregory, together with the new political thinking of Arthur Griffith expressed in his newspaper Sinn Féin and the organizations the National Council and the Sinn Féin League led to the identification of Irish people with the concept of a Gaelic nation and culture, completely independent of Britain. This was sometimes referred to by the generic term Sinn Féin. The third Home Rule Bill was introduced by British Prime Minister H. H. Asketh in 1912. The Irish Unionists, led by Sir Edward Carson, opposed Home Rule in what they saw as an impending Roman Catholic-dominated Dublin government. They formed the Ulster Volunteer Force on 13 January 1913, creating the first armed group of the Home Rule Crisis. The Irish Republican Brotherhood saw an opportunity to create an armed organization to advance its own ends, and on 25 November 1913 the Irish Volunteers, 
whose stated object was to secure and to maintain the rights and liberties common to all the people of Ireland, was formed. Its leader was Owen McNeill, who was not an IRB member. A provisional committee was formed that included people with a wide range of political views, and the volunteers' ranks were open to all able-bodied Irishmen without distinction of creed, politics or social group. Another militant group, the Irish Citizen Army, was formed by trade unionists as a result of the Dublin lockout of that year. The increasing militarization of Irish politics was overshadowed soon after by the outbreak of the First World War and Ireland's involvement in the conflict. Though many Irishmen had volunteered for Irish regiments and divisions of the new British Army at the outbreak of war in 1914, the growing likelihood of enforced conscription created a backlash. Opposition to the war was based particularly on the implementation of the Government of Ireland Act 1914 increasingly and controversially linked with her dual policy enactment of the Military Service Bill, a dual policy that would require Irish conscription to begin if there would be any hope of Ireland seeing the implementation of the Government of Ireland Act 1914. The linking of conscription and home rule outraged the Irish secessionist parties at Westminster, including the IPP, the AFIL and others, who walked out in protest and returned to Ireland to organise opposition, planning the rising. The Supreme Council of the IRB met on 5 September 1914, just over a month after the UK government had declared war on Germany. At this meeting, they decided to stage a rising before the war ended and to accept whatever help Germany might offer. Responsibility for the planning of the rising was given to Tom Clark and Sean McDermott. The Irish Volunteers, the smaller of the two forces resulting from the September 1914 split over support for the British war effort, set up a headquarters staff that included Patrick Pearce as Director of Military Organisation, Joseph Plunkett as Director of Military Operations and Thomas McDonough as Director of Training. Eamon Ceant was later added as Director of Communications. In May 1915, Clark and McDermott established a military committee within the IRB, consisting of Pierce, Plunkett and CANNT, to draw up plans for a rising. This dual role allowed the committee, to which Clark and McDermott added themselves shortly afterward, to promote their own policies and personnel independently of both the volunteer executive and the IRB executive, in particular volunteer chief of staff Owen McNeill, who supported a rising only on condition of an increase in popular support following unpopular moves by the London government such as the introduction of conscription or an attempt to suppress the volunteers or its leaders, and IRB President Dennis McCulloch, who held similar views. IRB members held officer rank in the volunteers throughout the country and would take their orders from the military committee, not from McNeil. Plunkett travelled to Germany in April 1915 to join Roger Casement who had gone there from the United States the previous year with the support of Clan Nargail leader John Devoy, and after discussions with the German ambassador in Washington, Count von Bernstorff, to try to recruit an Irish brigade from among Irish prisoners of war and secure German support for Irish independence. Together, Plunkett and Casement presented a plan which involved a German expeditionary force landing on the west coast of Ireland, while a rising in Dublin diverted the British forces so that the Germans, with the help of local volunteers, could secure the line of the River Shannon. James Connolly, head of the Irish Citizen Army, a group of armed socialist trade union men and women, was unaware of the IRB's plans and threatened to start a rebellion on his own if other parties failed to act. 
If they had gone it alone, the IRB and the volunteers would possibly have come to their aid. However, the IRB leaders met with Connolly in January 1916 and convinced him to join forces with them. They agreed to act together the following Easter and made Connolly the sixth member of the military committee. Thomas McDonough would later become the seventh and final member. Build up to Easter week. In an effort to thwart informers and, indeed, the volunteers' own leadership, Pierce issued orders in early April for three days of parades and maneuvers by the volunteers for Easter Sunday. The idea was that the Republicans within the organization would know exactly what this meant. While men such as McNeil and the British authorities in Dublin Castle would take it at face value. However, McNeil got wind of what was afoot and threatened to do everything possible short of phoning Dublin Castle to prevent the rising. McNeil was briefly convinced to go along with some sort of action when Mac Diamada revealed to him that a shipment of German arms was about to land in County Kerry. Planned by the IRB in conjunction with Roger Casement, he was certain that the authorities' discovery of such a shipment would inevitably lead to suppression of the volunteers. Thus the volunteers were justified in taking defensive action, including the originally planned maneuvers. Casement, disappointed with the level of support offered by the Germans, insisted on returning to Ireland on a German U-boat and was captured upon landing at Banner Strand in Trolley Bay. His reason for travel was to stop or at least postpone the rising. The arms shipment was lost when the German's ship carrying it, AUD, was scuttled after interception by the Royal Navy. The ship had already attempted a landing, but the local volunteers failed to rendezvous at the agreed time. The following day, McNeil reverted to his original position when he found out that the ship carrying the arms had been scuttled. With the support of other leaders of like mind, notably Bulmer Hobson and the O'Rahilly, he issued a countermand to all volunteers, cancelling all actions for Sunday. This succeeded in putting the rising off for only a day, although it greatly reduced the number of volunteers who turned out. British naval intelligence had been aware of the arms shipment, casements return, and the Easter date for the rising through radio messages between Germany and its embassy in the United States that were intercepted by the Navy and deciphered in Room 40 of the Admiralty. The information was passed to the Under Secretary for Ireland, Sir Matthew Nathan, on the 17th of April, but without revealing its source, and Nathan was doubtful about its accuracy. When news reached Dublin of the capture of the AUD and the arrest of Casement, Nathan conferred with the Lord Lieutenant, Lord Wimborne. Nathan proposed to raid Liberty Hall, headquarters of the Citizen Army, and volunteer properties at Father Matthew Park and at Kimmage. But Wimborne insisted on wholesale arrests of the leaders. It was decided to postpone action until after Easter Monday, and in the meantime Nathan telegraphed the Chief Secretary, Augustin Birrell, in London seeking his approval. By the time Birrell cabled his reply authorizing the action, at noon on Monday 24 April 1916, the rising had already begun. The rising in Dublin, a joint force of about 400 volunteers and citizen army gathered at Liberty Hall under the command of Commandant James Connolly. The rebel headquarters was the general post office where James Connolly, overall military commander and four other members of the military council, Patrick Pierce, Tom Clark, Sean McDermott and Joseph Plunkett were. After occupying the post office, the volunteers hoisted two Republican flags and Pierce read a proclamation of the Republic. Elsewhere, a rebel forces took up positions at the Four Courts, the centre of the Irish legal establishment, at Jacob's Biscuit Factory, Boland's Mill, the South Dublin Union Hospital Complex and the adjoining distillery at Marrowbone Lane. Another contingent, under Mitchell Mallon, dug in on St. 
Stevens Green. Although it was lightly guarded, volunteer and citizen army forces under Sean Connolly failed to take Dublin Castle, the centre of British rule in Ireland, shooting dead a police sentry and overpowering the soldiers in the guardroom, but failing to press home the attack. The Undersecretary, Sir Matthew Nathan, alerted by the shots, helped close the castle gates. The rebels occupied the Dublin City Hall and adjacent buildings. They also failed to take Trinity College, in the heart of the city centre and defended by only a handful of armed Unionist students. At midday a small team of volunteers and Fianna Erin members attacked the magazine fort in the Phoenix Park and disarmed the guards with the intent to seize weapons and blow up the building as a signal that the rising had begun. They set explosives but failed to obtain any arms. In at least two incidents, at Jacobs and Stevens Green, the volunteers and citizen army shot dead civilians trying to attack them or dismantle their barricades. Elsewhere, they hit civilians with their rifle butts to drive them off. The British military were caught totally unprepared by the rebellion and their response of the first day was generally uncoordinated. Two troops of British cavalry, one at the Four Courts and the other on O'Connell Street, sent to investigate what was happening took fire and casualties from rebel forces on Mount Street. A group of volunteer training corps men stumbled upon the rebel position and four were killed before they reached Beggar's Bush Barracks. The only substantial combat of the first day of the Rising took place at the South Dublin Union where a PK from the Royal Irish Regiment encountered an outpost of Eamon C. Ant's force at the northwestern corner of the South Dublin Union. The British troops, after taking some casualties, managed to regroup and launch several assaults on the position before they forced their way inside and the small rebel force in the tin hut to the eastern end of the Union surrendered. However, the Union complex as a whole remained in rebel hands. Three unarmed Dublin Metropolitan Police were shot dead on the first day of the Rising and the Commissioner pulled them off the streets. Partly as a result of the police withdrawal, a wave of looting broke out in the city centre, especially in the O'Connell Street area. A total of 425 people were arrested after the rising for looting. Tuesday to Saturday Lord Wimborne, the Lord Lieutenant, declared martial law on Tuesday evening and handed over civil power to Brigadier General William Lowe. British forces initially put their efforts into securing the approaches to Dublin Castle and isolating the rebel headquarters, which they believed was in Liberty Hall. The British commander, Lowe, worked slowly, unsure of the size of the force he was up against and with only 1,269 troops in the city when he arrived from the Curra camp in the early hours of Tuesday 25 April. City Hall was taken from the rebel unit that had attacked Dublin Castle on Tuesday morning. The rebels had failed to take either of Dublin's two main train stations or either of its ports at Dublin Port and Kingstown. As a result, during the following week, the British were able to bring in thousands of reinforcements from England and from their garrisons at the Curra and Belfast. By the end of the week, British strength stood at over 16,000 men. Their firepower was provided by field artillery summoned from their garrison at Athlone which they positioned on the north side of the city at Fibsborough and at Trinity College and by the patrol vessel Helga, which sailed up the Liffey, having been summoned from the port at Kingstown. On Wednesday 26 April, the guns at Trinity College and Helga shelled Liberty Hall, and the Trinity College guns then began firing at rebel positions, first at Boland's Mill and then in O'Connell Street. The principal rebel positions at the GPO, the Four Courts, Jacob's Factory and Boland's Mill saw little combat. The British surrounded and bombarded them rather than assault them directly. One volunteer in the GPO recalled, We did practically no shooting as there was no target. Similarly, the rebel position at St. Stephen's Green, held by the Citizen Army under Michael Mallon, was made untenable after the British placed snipers and machine guns in the Shelburne Hotel and surrounding buildings.
As a result, Malin's men retreated to the Royal College of Surgeons building where they remained for the rest of the week. However, where the insurgents dominated the routes by which the British tried to funnel reinforcements into the city, there was fierce fighting. Reinforcements were sent to Dublin from England, and disembarked at Kingstown on the morning of 26 April. Heavy fighting occurred at the rebel-held positions around the Grand Canal as these troops advanced towards Dublin. The Sherwood Foresters were repeatedly caught in a crossfire trying to cross the canal at Mount Street. Seventeen volunteers were able to severely disrupt the British advance, killing or wounding 240 men. Despite there being alternative routes across the canal nearby, General Lowe ordered repeated frontal assaults on the Mount Street position. The British eventually took the position, which had not been reinforced by the nearby rebel garrison at Boland's Mills. On Thursday but the fighting there inflicted up to two-thirds of their casualties for the entire week for a cost of just four dead volunteers. The rebel position at the South Dublin Union and Marrowbone Lane, further west along the canal, also inflicted heavy losses on British troops. The South Dublin Union was a large complex of buildings and there was vicious fighting around and inside the buildings. Cathal Bruja, a rebel officer, distinguished himself in this action and was badly wounded. By the end of the wick, the British had taken some of the buildings in the Union, but others remained in rebel hands. British troops also took casualties in unsuccessful frontal assaults on the Marrowbone Lane Distillery. The third major scene of combat during the week was at North King Street, behind the four courts, where the British, on Thursday, tried to take a well-barricaded rebel position. By the time of the rebel headquarters surrender, the South Staffordshire Regiment under Colonel Taylor had advanced only 150 yards down the street at a cost of 11 dead and 28 wounded. The enraged troops broke into the houses along the street and shot or bayoneted 15 male civilians whom they accused of being rebel fighters. Elsewhere, at Portobello Barracks, an officer named Bowen Colthurst summarily executed six civilians, including the pacifist nationalist activist, Francis Sheehy Skeffington. These instances of British troops killing Irish civilians would later be highly controversial in Ireland.